Welcome to Jive with Daniel. I'm your host, Rabbi Daniel Levine. Today, we're welcoming back on the podcast, Professor Andre Moli, Professor of Political Science at Chapman, specializing in violence connected to politics and religion. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for having me here. So I remember when I was uh, in grad school, my mom always told me that I should study something relevant. And I, I, I can't see any more relevant uh, topic to be studying now than violence, especially in politics and religion. So it's been uh, quite the year for you. Um, Let's start in Europe, we'll eventually hop around the globe, talk about America and the election, then we'll talk about the Middle East. This past Thursday, obviously, we received you know numerous messages and then eventually evolving into news reports of this Amsterdam pogrom against Israelis that were there for a soccer match. For listeners that you know might have heard something but still are a little bit unclear on the story, there were so many conflicting reports, can you just delineate what happened and then we'll sort of do a postmortem on the situation? Yeah, uh, so uh, as far as we know so far, I, th I think investigations are are still in the making in um, in in the Netherlands. So we'll we'll have to wait for for a full forensic report of what actually happened there. But according to the first reports about what it, what it was, it was a hunting uh, for Jews, uh, especially Israeli, that happened after a game with the Maccabi soccer team. The Tel Aviv Maccabi soccer team that played up there in uh, in Amsterdam. Now there is also some report that the Maccabi uh, fan, some of the most extreme fan, sort of provoked some sort of reaction within the game with chanting or with uh, with destroying uh, Palestinian flags. But at the same time, we do have also information that these actions were already being planned and, you know, eventually eventually were bound to happen no matter what. We know, for example, that there was a lot of chats on Telegram and a lot of taxi drivers were in, were sort of like involved in, in the planning. Um, they were sharing locations for Tel Aviv uh, and Israeli supporters where they were staying, with the hotel they were staying or housing they were staying, um, some of the most common places they would go after the game or before the game. Some people actually reported that they received threats on Wednesday, so even before the game started. So the reconstruction that people are making or trying to make to justify, in a way, what happened, it's also conflicted by information that this um, this hunts uh this hunting campaign was uh was going to happen no matter what uh so which of course sparked a lot of a lot of uh debates uh right after right after it so i'm going to zoom out to like the you know hundred thousand uh foot view here and then if you want to uh you know reground us feel free you know europe it seems like has never been able to keep Jews safe, right? Obviously, you know, the vast majority of historic anti-Semitism in at least Western Europe was, of course, Christian anti-Semitism, which then evolved into right-wing anti-Semitism, you know, 1800s, obviously, with Nazism. Then it seems like Europe, and, and this is where I want to sort of uh, get your opinion on this, Europe seems prone to much more extremes in America. So obviously, we can talk about, mm -hmm. you know, okay, in our politics here, probably the most public left-wing politician, someone like Bernie Sanders, most right-wing, you know, maybe we even say Trump, you know, Trump or Bernie Sanders would probably both be, you know, center right and center left in, in Europe, right? They'd probably be a lot more close to the middle than either of the extremes. And it seems like one, one of the things that's happening in Europe, and I'll sort of give the full picture and then you can uh, try to parse it to some extent, is, okay, Europe swung far right, obviously, World War II. And then there's been sort of this left-wing backlash that has tried to go against the xenophobia that was prevalent in the 20th century. And part of the experience of that, you know, anti-right-wing backlash has been untempered immigration. And immigration is seen as this, you know, incredible thing as many immigrants as possible come in. Obviously, you know, there's no borders in between the EU. This is also some of the major causes for Brexit, if people remember this, you know, several years ago. And so you have all this untempered immigration. The people calling out the immigration the hardest are far-right politicians who have, you know, xenophobic attitudes and probably also anti-Semitic attitudes. But it seems like Jews are just caught in the middle here because you have increased immigration from the Arab world and they're bringing in really, you know, anti-Semitism that existed maybe, you know, 40 years ago only in the Arab world, but now they're bringing it into the dominant left in Europe and sort of the only recourse for Jews and the only people blowing the whistle on this are far right-wing politicians who are also anti-Semitic. Um, 
So I'm curious, one, do you agree with that sort of framing? And why is Europe much more prone to these wild right wing and left wing swings than America? Well, I, I well, m m uh, there, there's a lot of on the bowling plate here. There, there's a lot of different teams and there's a lot of different angles we can approach that. One, of course, is as the one linked to the most recent immigration by that I probably mean the last 50, 40 to 50 years. Uh, so even before the great, uh, let's say, the great crisis of 2015 or the most recent one uh, of 2000, um, 2022, 2023 too, as well. But so that's one problem that intersect with the, what you were saying before, which is the would say political horizon of, of Europe that is prone to have these extreme, I would say, until probably 10, 15 years ago, we'll say extra parliamentary, so extra government, extra Congress uh, fringes will never make uh, a seat in any of the um, of the of the parliaments and in the, in the continent. And now they're sitting there, and they, in some cases they have some relevant, you know, weight over uh, over government coalition. So we have, in terms of anti-Semitism, we have, of course. The old neo Nazi, neo fascist uh, milieu that grew basically right after World War II never really stopped growing, even though it's more of a minority of anything else. And then we have the right, the, the, the extreme left on the other side that is clearly inspired by Soviet anti Semitism that was very pervasive in, um, in, uh, in most European countries, uh, starting with the 60s and the 70s and even through the 80s. Um, what we see also is a normalization of anti Semitism in most, you know, in some of the mainline parties, especially on the left. So I would say that the Jews are caught in some sort of a crossfire between all these uh, different political uh, uh, families that will, for one reason or another, whether that's a religious one, or there's a, a there's one that's linked to uh, post-colonial experiences or Soviet anti-Semitism or right-wing anti-Semitism, whatever is the declination of that, whatever is the flavor of that, they get caught. The Jewish communities get caught into into the crossfire between these uh, between these groups uh, that you know emerge. A, clearly in uh, in Amsterdam but also before that in 2023 we had you know different cases uh, of like anti-semitism growing so the trend of anti-semitism growing is is been constant over the last probably decades no even 50 years and of course if you put that on top of the immigration uh, that tends to carry across with with a lot of prejudice, if not open anti-Semitism, that comes from the uh, you know the 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 the, the, the origin countries. Uh, there's there's really no space for. Um, even though the government have tried, of course, in, in any way they could by, in, in, you know, by creating special offices to fight anti-Semitism and such and so, uh, there's really no room for that to be uh, suppressed uh, effectively um, nowadays because it's popping up pretty much everywhere. Whatever you see. Is there any left-wing anti-Semitism in places like Germany or France or Italy before immigration? Meaning if you go back to the 1950s and 1960s, you know, obviously there was a lot of, you know, Nazis that basically just, you know, right. back into normal life. I mean, you know, it, it seems like these countries did a terrible job at trying to figure out who was actually, you know, I involved in the Holocaust. You know, obviously some Nazis ended up, you know, fleeing to other places. South America is one of them. But a lot of them just, you know, as far as I'm concerned or aware, just kind of like assimilated back into normal life in, you know, Germany and, and Italy and France and all these other places. And, you know, nobody really paid attention. So there was obviously a lot of right-wing anti-Semitism in the late 40s and 50s and 60s and, you yep. know, to now. Uh, but what was, you know, what was, was there left-wing anti-Semitism in the 1950s in these countries before you started getting major immigration from the Middle East? Well, you mean, you mean in European countries, that's, yeah. that's what you're asking for. Uh, so, I mean, and, and, no, and no, 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 yeah. obviously in Russia. Uh, not really. You know. I, I think we really have to wait until the 60s and 70s to see that emerging really strong from, you know, Marxism, Marxist circles and all those parties and movement that were tied to the Soviet Union in some way that were getting funds, but were also getting instructions. 
So it, you know, right above that threshold, actually, there was a tendency to look at Israel as an example of decolonization, or or an example of you know self determination of a people. There was some sort of positive outlook. Starting with the 60s and the 70s, that changed massively into just looking at Israel as an example of American imperialism, an example of white colonialism, and such and so. That coincide with what we know was happening with the Soviet Union trying to push that narrative uh, through, uh, you know, via some of the parties they were they were uh, they were supporting in the hope of, of course, uh, putting you know a thumb or a foot uh in into into americans in you know western affairs or western interest in uh, um in the middle east but also in other areas of the planet so i think that coincide with that most dramatically even though I mean, we can't exclude that people on the left were anti-semite for other reasons such as cultural reasons or religious reasons there will always also a tendency in europe to 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 you know to consider the Jewish people as a problem from a religious perspective or religious point of view. So in the fifties and you know forties and fifties and sixties, of course, if you go to an Italian uh, church on Sun on Friday night, they will have prayers for the perfidious Jews. Uh, that was removed, of course, by the Vatican right after. But you still have that mentality that Jews are some kind of anomaly. Okay, that doesn't you know doesn't really Religiously speaking, is not explainable. You have to wait much later with Jean Paul II to have that sort of, you know, reconnection and reaffirmation that um, the gifts of God are not are not negotiable. So the, the Jewish people has a you know relationship with with God that is specific to their experience, and the Catholic Church doesn't intervene with that. But before that, it was still and there's still in, somehow it's still there, and you you can see that even with people that are not really identified with one party or the other, but they're leaning towards the left, there is some cultural anti-Semitism that might have a religious base or some rejection of guilt, too. That is also that is also uh, an important phenomenon we have to account for. So a lot of people say, like, well, you know, there's been a lot of years since, since the Holocaust, and now, you know, we, we, we know, we don't want to feel guilty anymore. That kind of swing the balance towards uh towards um that narrative embracing that narrative that now it's the Jews doing the same thing that the Nazi was doing to them. So you see all these things I was saying before. It's a very it's very hard to disentangle what's going what's what's happening there because you have all these different uh affluence to to anti Semitism in Europe, which is not part of the American experience whatsoever so it's really hard for someone who, who who lives in this country or especially someone who's brought up in this country to understand why europeans may act that way which is not you know as simple or as linear uh, as you would as you would imagine even from you know pro pal supporters here in, in in the united states they might show a level of anti-semitism which might be either political or of some any sort, but they don't show all that cultural substrata that you see in Europe. In, yeah. in, well, there's, in, I mean, I, I've, you know, I've been uh, write, writing down some notes because I, I think that's uh, really interesting how you just laid that out. It seems like a lot of the people who end up in America that are part of the Islamic pro-Palestinian community are a lot better assimilated into American culture than Islamic immigrants to to Europe. And I think, you know, one, there's a lot more of them in Europe. So I think it's just a lot easier to have these homogenous, you know, towns or neighborhoods that basically like, you know, when I was in uh, Barcelona a couple months ago with uh, my wife, Shana, we would walk through full neighborhoods and you did not feel like you were in Spain anymore. It really felt like I, you know, yeah. stepped into, you know, e Egypt or something. And, yeah. you know, without, without giving any uh, moral claim to that, you know, in, in America, you, there's still a lot more assimilation, you know, maybe, you know, you go to places like Dearborn, Michigan, it's a little bit different, but even in places like Orange County that have big Muslim populations, you know, most of them are going to public schools or, you know, obviously being taught English, they're, you know, engaging, and, and that seems very different. So a lot of the sort of visceral fundamentalist Islamic anti-Semitism is sort of more visceral in Europe. Here, it seems tepper down for a more progressive audience, despite the fact that I think it's also pretty uh, pernicious here. Also in Europe, I mean, for all that people like to uh, 
quote unquote crap on America and say that, you know, religion plays a big role in politics in America, which of course it does. But America fundamentally was built off a, you know, fundamental distinction of church and state where that sort of had to be uh, earned in Europe and, and it never really was earned. Meaning if you look through both, you know, the history of the Catholic Church and then also the roots of Martin Luther and Protestantism, you know, you can pick your favorite, uh, you know, city and or country in Europe. The amount of anti-Semitism that is inherent within the Catholic tradition and the Protestant tradition is mind-boggling. And so you can imagine, of course, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, interesting scholarship on, say, specifically connecting Martin Luther to Nazism. You know, you can draw pretty much a straight line there of that type of ideology, what Luther was saying about Jews, and then straight line through, you know, what Hitler was saying about Jews. And it's not, you know, it's not so mind-boggling, you know, from an American perspective, it's always why did no one say anything in the 19, you know, late 1920s and early 30s when Hitler was writing all this? And the answer is because they were also being told this at church and they were also being told this, you know, when they read the, you know, their commentaries on the Bible and maybe they didn't, you know, explicate their anti-Semitism in any way, but that was deeply ingrained to the point where all Hitler had to do was really, you know, activate it, not really create it. America does seem a little bit different on that level because, everybody's kind of starting off with a baseline of secularization. I, I know that's not really true, but it's mm -hmm. still, it still feels different in some fundamental way than Europe, where, you know, even the Jewish experience. I mean, I've talked a lot on this podcast about the idea of American Jewish exceptionalism, that for any place in the diaspora, America just has and is exceptional for Jews. Now, of course, it doesn't mean things are perfect, but what it means is from the outset of Jews being in America, even before 1776, this, you, know, you can go back to the 1600s when Jews were getting on early explorer ships from Europe and they were trying to figure out, you know, okay, what are the laws in these, you know, random towns that are now on the Northeast? And ultimately, you know, and the anti-capitalists will hate this, but the, you know, capitalism was the name of the game. You know, if Jews are going to help the economy here and if Jews are going to show up to work just like everybody else, okay, great. They can be, you know, equal to, to everybody else. And so it doesn't make a difference if you're, you know, Jewish or whatever flavor of Christianity, you know, generally, obviously there was still a lot of anti-Semitism and a lot of, you know, anti, you know, Catholic sentiment in America there, but America just did distinguish itself in a way that I'm hearing you say that uh, Europe isn't. Um, I, I want to move us to, to specifically violence because the sentiment of anti-Semitism doesn't always mean it's going to manifest in violence. You, you, you've obviously, you're obviously from Europe, you went to school in Europe, you spent most of your life there. I'm just a, uh, you know, every couple of years I, I go on a trip there. Um, and I've never, you know, wore to keep on Europe my entire life. And when I was little, it was sort of framed as, you know, there's a lot of anti-Semitism here and sort of the, the implication was that was more right-wing anti-Semitism. So the mm -hmm. would be, you know, neo-Nazi thugs you know, just seeing that I'm Jewish and, you know, punching me in the face or something like that, that fear obviously still exists. But now when I go to major cities, you know, Geneva, Barcelona, Amsterdam, Paris, you know, to name some, you know, the major cities I've been to in the last few years, the fear now is almost coming from the left. It's that you don't want to get beat up by exactly what happened last Thursday night by, by Islamist thugs. Do you think that that, I mean, is that the new paradigm of anti-Semitism in Europe? Is it just because it's a lot harder to name it without sounding like a racist. I mean, what do you think has shifted? I mean, I, again, again, there's a lot of there's a lot to unpack here. So uh, I just want to take a reference point of reference of what you said before about the, the the separation between church and state, which, as we know, also exists and is very ingrained in the system in France, for example, which but also has a very different way of, you know, designing it and a very way different way of of understanding it, which is the separation starts at a point where the state reject any sort of religion. In the, in the, in the American case, there is. A, there is an allowance for your religion experience as long as it fits with the uh, with the idea that the institutions are not governed by religion. But that becomes in France a re total rejection for religion in the public sphere, which means that by the by the eighties, the seventies, and nineties, to the French government didn't even interest, they wasn't even interested in, in dealing with religion at all. So that allows other experience, other religious experience to mature under the radar, as in the case of some of the areas that you were mentioning before, some of the banlieue in Paris, they're, they're, they're almost like cosbas, or they're almost like this is a little piece of 
of Algeria, this little piece of Morocco, which is enshrined in, in the French Republic, but it's nothing to do with the French Republic, basically. Um, so in, in terms of what you were saying before, again, uh, in, um, for how do, how do we tell if we're dealing with right wing or left wing or any other kind of... Uh, I think that, uh, yes, it was common years ago to... and even recently, to understand anti-Semitism as a pathology of the far right. So the natural predator for Jews were neo-Nazi or, or skinheads or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and, and the level of anti-Semitism that was manifested by the left was more on an intellectual level, okay? A complete rejection for all religion or for ethno-religion in particular, uh, and of course the Palestinians or and the problem with, uh, you know, the, the, the crisis in the Middle East. But it was on a level that was never until the 80s, I would say, or 90s, was never infused by violence. Uh, what we see now, that that changed. So in a way, what happened was an alignment between the far right and the far left, uh, which has been described in, in other areas of politics in Europe. So talking about the, the you know, the Simpson made that funny joke about the Nazi communists, right? Uh, and we saw that in Germany, a coalition of the far right and the far left actually had a lot of success in, in some of the landers. So what you see here, you see an alignment between these two and you see that the tactics that were once used only by far right groups are now also in the level of anti-Semitism, the level of violence attached to anti-Semitism was also used by the left. Uh, so it's very common nowadays when you talk to someone who is very engaged in politics in the left, for, you know, for example, with the, the what happened in, in, uh, in Amsterdam, to say, what well, the Jews had it coming, right? So it, the, the, the idea that uh, you can be violently anti-Semitic, uh, it's not taboo for the left anymore. So it, it's really... Uh, but it, it is like, really dangerous. It's more than that. I'm gonna I'm gonna push you a little bit. It's it's more than it not being taboo. The very act of calling out anti-Semitism that's due to these migrant groups from the Middle okay. East Let's, is considered okay. racist. Meaning, I was actually looking earlier today. Um, you know, right before we recorded, I was looking up you know official statements of these various countries about anti-Semitism and. You know, they're operating in like a 1950s paradigm, meaning for them, anti-Semitism is only the right, you know, it, you know, they in, in the same thing, you know, we're against any forms of hate, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, racism, sexism, and then they talk about the history of anti-Semitism stay in, in Italy, and it's all, you know, right wing fascist anti-Semitism, and there's no conversation at all about the sort of, I mean, it's almost the same thing in America, right, America, okay, you know, still more of the violent anti-Semitism in America is right wing. You know, hopefully it doesn't change, but there's signs that it's changing because now also the two other major, you know, cohorts of people that might produce physical anti-Semitism are also pro-Palestinian supporters and also black Hebrew Israelites. You know, in New York, there's been a huge proliferation of you know, black anti-Semitism, anti-Semitic attacks against Jews for the last many years. It's just not really covered by any, you know, mainstream media because, it's taboo to talk about, you know, this right. because, you know, how dare you? You're you're picking on a community that's already historically maligned. So it's the same thing in Europe. So that's that's that, that's only why I want to push you because it seems no. like you can't even call it out to some extent if you're in the mainstream liberal in Europe. Now I'm saying this as sort of an armchair uh, sociologist. You're actually from there and study this. I'm curious. No, I mean, uh, so fair enough, and I'll I'll let you push me, and and I'll go there in a minute, in just one second, actually. So one thing that you said, uh, and and you're saying like there's a rejection, there's almost on a cognitive level, a rejection for the idea, for entertaining the idea that the left can be anti-Semite, anti-Semite, or can some migrants group or minority groups can be such. Uh, the first one is actually tied to a much larger cognitive dissonance, which is if you look at the stats that are produced by Europol or, you know, any law enforcement or even European unions, 
uh, in terms of um, like stats about terrorism, the the number of left wing related, you know, accident is far, far more, you know, far larger, like ast astonishingly larger than the one that is uh, conducted, you know, produced by far right groups. Uh, even though that is the reality, nobody talks about that. Because everybody likes to talk about how bad the far right is, how bad the alt right is, how bad the neo Nazi are, and they are all bad. I'm not trying to justify, but nobody is talking about these other groups. They're engaging even more in violence. Well, it's the and same that's thing. I mean, just to just to air a little bit more of my frustration, I'll, I'll bring it to America, which I do know a little bit better than uh, pontificating about Europe. I mean, it's the same way that I feel now about all these progressive and DEI groups. that are now, you know, uh, you know, talking about the anniversary of Kristallnacht, as if that's the most relevant thing to Jews, you know, in 2024, remembering anti-Semitism that happened 85, 86 years ago. Kristallnacht was terrible, don't get me wrong, but most Jews I know, you know, me as somebody who wears a kippah, I'm not worried about Kristallnacht being caused by Nazis on the streets. Right. I'm worried about, you know, the other types of anti-Semitism that I was just delineating. It just seems, it just seems easy. It's like a a get out of jail free card to say, you know, no, listen, we really care about anti-Semitism and yet not actually address the roots. I mean, tokenism, tokenism is not is not new to to us. So we know we know that's that's an easy way out to say that you're not anti-Semite because you remember the you know Kristallnacht or you remember this or you remember that. But and there's always a but at the end of it, right? And you know one of the, one of the most amazing things that happened to me when it's like these days we're talking to people about that and say like, well, we can't really see a parallel here with which whatever happened in Amsterdam or whatever happened eighty years ago. It's say no it's not because you know this time the violence was started by you know these Maccabi fans and say well even Kristallnacht if you really look into that it was an homicide right <laughs> of, of a German diplomat so I think I think if you want to find an excuse you can find it for everything and I think that's what's happening and the left is really looking for excuse they're really good at finding an excuse that actually you know might even make sense to a certain point uh and and it's it's frustrating and but I think it also started off into you know locking a look you know talking about the academia and the way academia process these things and there's there's really no way you can insert the doubt that maybe we should look at um how bad the far left is or maybe we should look at how bad certain groups are even some immigrants groups like not, not because pointing finger or anything but if there are dynamics that are somehow or trends that are somehow problematic i would I would like to know, and I would like to do something without being constantly accused. I mean, I'm not being accused of being Islamophobic or anything, but, you know, I heard about that from colleagues. They were frustrated because they can't even think about showing some numbers or stats about crime distribution or about, or about terrorism or about violence that are immediately pointed out as they are Islamophobic because they're entertaining it's, it's that idea. the only thing that is going to serve as a bulwark against the far right getting elected, meaning... The, the 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 thing that keeps states the most stable, you know, and this is, you know, mainstream view in political science is having a stable and strong right of center because it yeah. keeps the far right in check and it keeps the left in check. And again, it's not, not to say anything about what actual policies it'll pursue, but if the choices are in Europe, a left that is not willing to talk about immigration and violence and things like that in a critical way and insert far right, you know, fascist here who wants closed borders and kick all the immigrants out. People are going to go towards the the, the fascist party and it's going to be even worse for these countries. So, you know, there, there, there has to be sort of a centrist or, you know, normative center right or even a center left, you know, a liberal position that understands borders and understands, you know, you don't just want open immigration. And this is much a much bigger deal in Europe than in America. I mean, if we think that immigration was a big issue in the last election last Tuesday, I mean, in Europe, immigration is, you know, probably oh, two yeah. or three times as much. I mean, Brexit was all about, to some extent, immigration and everything happening there. No, absolutely. And, and you, know, you know, Schengen, which you mentioned before, the, the the absence of internal borders between the countries, that's that's not even true anymore because most countries reinstated their borders between each other precisely because they want to control immigration to a certain point, but they're refusing in some cases to engage with that thought because 
they got too much corner into just thinking of immigration about about immigration as a resource or some sort of enrichment process and it is for a lot of you know in a lot of ways from the demographic uh, downward strands to correct that so you know it's also financial um uh, resource but they're not willing they haven't been willing to talk about the dark side of it so what are the problems that it brings about and how we fix those problems so we intervene those problems in a systemic way in the organic way you know, certainly not with whatever recipe the, the far right is proposing but they haven't really thought through that and they're so so checked into that that response said we always have to say that everything is good everything is fine and there's no problem here it's really hard for them to understand what some of these problems are in the first place so the 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 anti-semitism that is you know organic to some of these groups or these uh minorities slash majorities in certain areas it's it's something that is undeniable or at least should be undeniable but there's no way from the left and part of the center and some of the like was a mainstream right as well to touch that without coming across as if they were actually accusing immigrants to be a problem uh so it it's politically speaking it's very problematic for certain parts of the left to understand it and even if they understand it they don't know their way out of it because now they spent 20 years or 30 years saying that there's no problem with that there's everything's going to be fine now they have to admit to that that is not going to be fine because you have literally have gangs of people killing or or chasing Jews down the street in France Italy Germany uh, all and Great Britain Spain pretty much everywhere um so i mean there there's no there's no damage control that can be done to that to that extent and also what what didn't help uh quote unquote of course i understand it on a personal level is that jewish community has been constantly reducing their numbers uh emigrating to israel so there, there's also that issue or becoming less visible because that was the easiest thing to do you were saying before i'm not wearing my kippah when i go to europe and most european jews don't wear their kippah because of that reason I mean, I um, rabbis i was in show for i was in barcelona for purim last year and i had my kippah in my pocket and then i put it on once i got in and the rabbi came up to me and i was clearly not uh, from there you know it was all uh, it was actually all israelis you know that were there you know moroccan israelis that moved to barcelona for business you know a tiny synagogue and the rabbi came up to me you know after services before i left and just said you know Welcome to Barcelona. Uh, make sure to take off your kibbutz before you leave. I yeah. mean, these are some of the freest, most progressive countries in the world in 2024. And mm -hmm. it's unsafe for Jews to go out publicly for fear of, you know, it's not the same fear, you know, when I'm walking down the street here, you know, maybe someone will scream free Palestine at me. I'm not so worried about getting punched in the face or, you know, beaten with a crowbar, you know, maybe it's gone up a little bit. But in Europe, I mean, it quite literally is a visceral fear I mean, that's that's insane. I mean, I, I, I don't need to tell you that, but just to highlight this problem, it just seems like it's one of the craziest things in the world today that within good civil society in first world democratic countries, we just have sort of accepted as normal. I, of course, don't blame anyone. I mean, if I was in Europe, I mean, again, it's easy to say this from my perspective. I don't see how Jews are living in Europe. I mean, I literally don't understand Jewish communities that are there. It seems terrible. It seems like you're you're living two different existences, or it almost seems like how I imagine Jews operated, you know, pre-emancipation Europe, where you had your little Jewish village that you knew you were relatively safe unless the government changes their mind. But then when you go to the the big city, you of course just try to blend in and keep as low of a profile as possible for fear that they're gonna, you know, find out that you're Jewish and start to uh, you know, malign you in some way. I, I don't know. It just seems, you know, especially growing up in America. Which again, you know, for all its faults, you know, greatest country in the world for a whole variety of reasons, mm -hmm. you know, it's just not a fear in, in America. No. You know, I've never, you know, okay, there have been a couple times in my life where I considered not wearing a kippah in very specific occasions due to anti-Semitism, but it's not something I think about putting on my kippah every day before I leave. It's just normal. And right. the fact that it's not normal in all these other countries especially given their history. I mean, you know, just the, the one other thing I'll say, and then I'll let you have the last word on Europe before we move to uh, America, and then eventually we can hit the Middle East. 
is that the progressive movement in America, due to America's history of racism, has gone all in on being anti-racist. And, you know, maybe that's yeah. good, maybe that's bad, but because of our horrific legacy of slavery and then Jim Crow and anti-Black racism, now in progressive movements, it's like it's still the 1960s in terms of, you know, the Black community needs to be protected at all costs. And again, you know, we can debate the merits of that, but progressives have sort of doubled down on protecting this community that's been historically maligned. In Europe, it's Jews that are the ones that have been historically maligned for thousands of years. And then, of course, you know, in you know certain Western European countries with the Holocaust, the fact that it's the progressive movements should be doing all these same things for the Jewish community. So when you're in Italy or when you're in Germany or when you're in France, not only should there not be left-wing anti-Semitism, Jews should be appointed to every single board. There should be DEI programs at every single university talking about, you know, how much we need to elevate Jewish voices because of what happened. People need to always say you need to check your systemic anti-Semitic privilege. I mean, that would be the equivalent of America. But yet the left in Europe has sort of doubled down on this anti-Semitism and said, ah, yes, anti-Semitism, that was that really bad thing the right wing did during the Holocaust. That's all over, right? There's no legacy of the Holocaust anti-Semitism. In fact, the Holocaust was so bad, let's just actually blame, you know, what Israel's doing on Gaza. Oh, that's that's actually the most relevant way to use the Holocaust in modern discourse. It's it's mind-boggling. Um, and, you know, the last thing I'll say on this, I know I, I know I said last time it was the last thing I said. I mean, this, you know, wh wh whenever I think about Europe, because again, Europe, you know, has such interesting legacy in terms of the 19th and 20th century Jewish history, the more, you know, Herzl's words just ring in my ear of why he saw the need for political Zionism in the first place. It's a lot harder as an American to understand Herzl, because my experience in America has genuinely been a country that sees me as equal. But Herzl writing in Europe basically came to this conclusion, you know, what, 130 years ago, nothing we do in this country is going to lead, you know, in this continent is going to lead to us being treated safely. Therefore, we need an army. So here, I'll let you have the last one in Europe, then we'll move to America. No, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, just to start with uh, the, the how how important Europe is for, for, for the Jewish people, if you think about like Rome, for example, is the oldest community, Jewish community of the diaspora. I mean, it precedes the diaspora as a community, actually. It precedes the start of it. Amsterdam was called the Jerusalem of the West uh, in, in the years that you mentioned. There's so much Jewish history in in Europe. And we, we, we even have a day for, for Jewish culture in, in, in Europe, so to, so to speak. But the Jewish people has never been quite say normalize or integrated in 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 this in the, the cultural discourse of europe it was always being seen as some sort of anomaly that most european people didn't really and still don't really understand and i and probably we, we we've made We've made some some mistakes in the way we presented ourselves as a religion instead of presenting ourselves as a people, and 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 there's a whole conversation about like the the, the ethical component because Europeans say that you're all different. You're you're not an ethnic group, but you are. You're not a religion, but you are. You're not this, but you are. You're a political movement. You're Israeli. Everybody is Israeli. So one part of it, that, for example, talking to people that were blaming. You know they're constantly blaming Israel for genocide. They say they're, they're surprised, and then you know that that the Jewish people around don't do anything about it. It's like, well, but not every Jew is Israeli, so don't not every Jew votes for Netanyahu because they cannot vote in Israel. So you need to understand these things. So I think there's a problem in 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 understanding what the Jewish people is, and and because you don't understand what it is, you fear what it is, and and you can't you can't really figure out how how to report that. So. It's easy to consider the Jews dead in the Holocaust because that's an historical thing that happened. So, I mean, Jews as victims, we, we process that. But but everything else that happened after that, we really don't know what to do with it. And that's a big issue with uh, with Europe, in, in my in my view, that uh, if it's not resolved uh, properly, it will continue to it continue to propagate this this latent anti-Semitism that you can find in European culture. Uh, yeah, let's, let's move to America, because one of the interesting things, you know, I, I I think the moral of the story is that we spend too much time reading the news, which, you know, is my uh, post-election resolution is to cut down my uh, news reading in half. So that's, uh, you know, people want to be more, uh, more engaged in what's going on. I want to be less engaged in current events. But you get this very interesting, you know, 
trend of, of leaders from these European countries, you know, from France and from Germany and from, you know, Italy and, and, and England, kind of like sneering and looking down on Americans, especially Trump. And, you know, I did my entire last podcast about Trump. I didn't vote for Trump. I, you know, I, I you know, find Trump obnoxious, but, you know, it is interesting that, you know, just the way that we're talking about this from the Jewish experience, I mean, all for all of, you know, Macron's, you know, moral superiority, you know, nice liberal, you know, soft spokenness and, you know, he's a sharp dresser and blah, blah, blah. He has failed to keep Jews safe in, in France. And meanwhile, American politicians really on, on both sides generally have been able to keep Jews safe. And, you know, so so it is it is very interesting kind of comparing the sort of uh, moral and political superiority that Europeans tend to feel. And, you know, they always laugh about the American healthcare system. And listen, there are a lot of things in America that, that should be laughed at. You know, I, I always rant about how food is healthier in Europe. I think that's an important thing to uh, point out. But it is also interesting to consider this angle from a lot of people that, you know, point to these countries in Western Europe and say, ah, this is, you know, why can't we be more like, you know, insert country? I always think, you know, I actually want to be a little bit less like France than, than mm -hmm. other people. Um, so uh, talking about Trump for, for a moment, um, what do you make of, of the last election? I'm curious, you know, it's, you know, we're about uh, what, five, five days out from the election, obviously mm. shock in terms of Trump basically doing better in every single group. Actually, the only, I was looking up these statistics earlier, he lost 1% of white voters um, compared yeah. to last time, but in every other minority group, including Jews, including Arabs, Blacks, Latinos, women, he actually did better than he did in 2020. What do you make of this? Because this isn't just this one group felt that their opportunity would be a little bit better under Trump. This was a wholesale rejection of Kamala and not just Kamala, the Democratic Party with his, what, what's happening in Congress as well. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, starting off with the with the moral superiority, you know, and yeah, that's that's a tendency for Europe to feel better on on any account. But I and I also say that people here in the United States have met that they're constantly uh, idolizing Europe on many accounts, including the healthcare. They haven't really set their foot in Europe for more than five or six days, in my opinion, because they have no idea what's going on in Europe. They they tend to have this this Bernie Sanders-ish idea of how good Europe is. That was probably true maybe 30 years ago in a very specific areas of Northern Europe, but it's really not what's going on in the rest of the continent. Going to Trump, going to the elections, and me and you too, so I haven't voted for him too. So I can disclose that publicly. Um, yes, I confirm your forensics. I've done a forensics with my students in both of my classes. We look at a lot of these demographics, how they moved. Uh, one one thing to be added to that, that the, mo the move wasn't something just recent. It was something that we've seen even in the last election with 2020 and 2016. We've seen a constant motion from uh, the Democratic Party towards the center of the party, towards, in some cases, crossing the, the party line and getting into, into the Republican field. So we've seen that specifically in certain demographics, such as Hispanic, particularly men, but also black men, but also Asian. So we've seen all these things. Things. We've seen this in the newest generation. People who voted for the first time, they tended to literally switch from voting in high numbers from the Democratic Party to voting in high numbers for uh, for the Republican Party. So we're seeing all these things, including that loss of 1%, which is interesting because some of that wasn't even absorbed by the Democratic Party. These are, these are people that haven't really voted. And there's some argument that says that these are actually the extreme right wing of the, the Republican Party that don't recognize in, in themselves in Trump and the MAGA movement anymore. So if anything, that could be a positive news if we're willing to hear that, because people that were, you know, linked to certain like violent experience or certain violent ideology within the Republican field. They're now abandoned the Republicans and doing whatever they do. Uh, and at the same time, we see that the uh, constituencies for Trump move towards the left. 
basically, if not the left or the center. Um, so, and, and again, there's so many things we can say about that for the Hispanic voters, for example, when people, some of my colleagues too, they tend to consider these minorities, even when they're not minorities, they're majorities, even when they're not doing worse than they usually do, but they're doing really good for themselves. And so when, with a, with a, with a, what we say, with a, just a quick sentence, now they're middle class and they vote as middle class. So they don't vote as minorities anymore, but because we like to think about them as they were. Where we, we think they should be voting for a certain party, but this is something that didn't happen, which is interesting for me because it will set the bar for, for the administration. So in my opinion, Trump cannot discount the fact that now is not a white dominated party. It's not a white male dominated, male dominated party anymore. It's got women, it's got women of color, it's got Hispanics, it's got Asians, it's got you know, more educated people, less educated people, it's got urban voters, suburban voters that also voted for him. We have a lot of red dots popping up in Philadelphia or the five boroughs of Chicago or, or um, and all these areas. So um, the, the, the Republican strategists will have to, to consider that if they want to survive midterms in, in, in two years. So and there's- the fact that the constant question with Trump is that there's Trump the person and Trump the policymaker. And yeah. it seems like most people that vote for Trump, okay, there's probably the 20 or 30 percent of people that love Trump the person, but most Trump voters probably hate the Trump the person. They just like the policies better. Yeah. And they like the you know repudiation of whatever they see as the the Democrat elite culture or whatever. Um, in terms of young people, because this is interesting, everybody always expects, you know, the young people to be the uh, saving grace for the Democrats. And of course, you know, a whole group of people, you know, we both work on college campuses, you know, it, it was basically the young people that got Trump elected, you know, if all 18 through 22 year olds yeah. who had just registered to vote had all come out and voted for Harris, she for sure would have won this past election. Um, but instead the group, it, they, they basically split the difference leaning even a little bit Republican. Um, I said this on the last podcast, but the more I think about it, the more true I think it is that Republicans are now the anti-establishment party. I mean, when, when I was growing up, even, you know, 15 years ago, it was the opposite, right? The left was sort of the cool, anti-establishment and the Republican were, you know, Wall Street and the corporations and, you know, the institutions, right? A lot of the big religious institutions were Republican. And so if you wanted to be, you know, rebellious and stick it to the man, or if you thought that what the corporations were doing were greedy or unethical, or you didn't trust, you know, the system, you know, being a liberal or even being a progressive was sort of the way to buck the system. You know, this is even more true if you go back to the you know, the 70s and 80s, you know, than even me who grew up in the 90s. Now it's the opposite, meaning I can, you know, even though I didn't vote for Trump, I can understand being a 20 year old, you know, especially male, but even a 20 year old in general, you grow up, Democrats have been in power in the presidency the last 12 out of 16 years, right? We always forget that because we focus so much on Trump, but we had Obama twice, then Trump, then Biden. So 12 out of the last 16 years. So basically their entire life bar four years, was Democrat. The institution, the school system they're a part of leans Democrat. The news leans Democrat. Their parents, you know, if they're in the suburbs, probably lean Democrat. You know, fewer people are going to church or synagogue. And, you know, even if you're Jewish, a lot of the synagogues lean Democrat also. And a lot of the churches have become more liberal. So if they go at all. And so now I can kind of see a young person basically saying, you know, the way to rise up against the system is actually to be Republican, not to mention this sort of new iteration of the Republican Party is calling out Wall Street and corporate interests. And, you know, again, well, it, it's still to see if they're actually going to pursue an anti-corporate policy strategy. That I'm not sure about. But in rhetoric, I mean, I, I, I haven't seen anybody be as harsh uh, about corporate interests and Wall Street and all these other institutions as, as the Trump administration has. And I'm curious how much you think that plays a role, because I've become convinced this is the issue that 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 move the needle and everything else, you know, because everything's wrapped up in this, even immigration and economics, to some extent, is all wrapped up in just, you know, establishment versus anti-establishment, you, you know, back to our oh. conversation. Like, yeah, go for it. No, I mean, I mean, there, there's 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 some good some good argument to that narrative, and we'll we'll see that also in if we're looking at the financial of the two campaigns, we'll see that you know. No matter how much you can hate super PACs uh, from from a liberal perspective, but uh, uh, Kamala Harris collected, I think, between three to one or five to one, depending on what bracket you're looking at. Um, I mean, 
funds over Trump. So, I mean, they outspended Trump, they outfunded Trump. So there was no, there was, there is no doubt that the big money went to, um, to the Democrats for uh, for this campaign, and yet they lost, and they lost for partially for what you say. So uh, if you think about like two needles, basically one needle moved to that direction because people perceive the Democratic Party as being more establishment, more you know you know system or deep state, whatever you know it's a flavor you want to call it. So they voted for the Republican Party that they see less involved in that sort of um, uh, in that sort of uh, world, but in the other side you also have the far left or the left side of the party was absolutely disenchanted with with mainline or mainstream um Democrat and they didn't vote or they vote down the ballot instead of voting for uh, for Kamala Harris or instead of voting in for Donald Trump. Somebody cast their vote over there, like happened with Bernie Sanders, with Clinton, of course. But some other people they just decided, okay, this is not this is not working anymore. The, this 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 idea that my interest and the interests I care about are uh, promoted by the Democratic Party is really, really not happening, and and so I'm not supporting them. I would see for you know issues like the Middle East, but even like racial issues or gender related issue or all these other issues. Like, um, I think I was reading something about the differences between um the Democratic grassroots movements and and the Republican grassroots movements or the MAGA movement, which is in its simplicity can actually account for more diversity than what the Democratic Party can do because the Democratic Party pretty much split their constituencies in bubbles and then they try to stick them together with that big fat lie of academia that is inter intersectionality that doesn't 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 really do the job people don't perceive that as being close to their interest they they don't they don't they don't look at the Democratic Party as a party that can't give practical answers to practical problems anymore and you see that in uh, in a lot of things, such like the Los Angeles and I think the whole state of California voted for the prop to turn uh, um, shoplifting again. You know, yeah, exactly. So it's like now it's a felony again. So and you see that the majority of the person, the people that voted, the numbers are astonishing. Well, the more conservative DA in LA won by like 75% of the vote or something. I mean, it's correct. Crazy. So, like we we're saying back in Europe, so the Democratic Party doesn't seem to be able to offer answers. It may be the right answer, like from a moral standpoint, I'm not denying that, but it doesn't seem to be to be offering right answers to uh to the need of the people. That's why Hispanics flocked to the Republican Party. That's why African American flocked to the Republican Party. Young people flocked to the Republican Party because they're scared about their future and they don't want to live in this kind of future that was set up by by their parents. And they as you were saying before, they recognize their parents as mainstream Democrats, so they either go to the left or go to the right of that. But they were not they were not looking at, at as that as an example. And to, liberals are too afraid to have difficult nuanced conversations. I mean you wouldn't be, you know, maybe maybe you wouldn't be surprised, but other people might be surprised. The number of professors I reach out to running this podcast to talk to them about, you know, current events and politics. And you know, they a lot of them know me well and sort of know I'm constantly a devil's advocate person and throwing out ideas and it's just kind of the way that I talk. And the number of people that are just afraid to go on record talking about things like politics or foreign policy or, mm -hmm. you know, any of these cultural issues or DEI, I mean, they'll, they'll tell me their opinions in private and we can get coffee and have a great conversation for 45 right. minutes. And the second I say, you know, hey, this would be really interesting, you know, I'm at this point, I'm probably a centrist. You're probably left of center, insert professor here. Let's have a conversation about this because this might be interesting. And they're like, ah, I don't, I don't, I don't feel comfortable. So, okay. So if the only people talking about all of these issues are going to be the right, then of course people are going to vote in the right if they're worried about the issue. I mean, I, I think this is just such an obvious point, but the left is, is losing the whole narrative because, you know, the Harris administration thought all they needed was to get you know, Oprah and Taylor Swift's endorsement, and that would convince all the young people to vote for her, right. as opposed to whatever people are actually worried about, which is all no, these other no. issues. And, you and, know. 
and even that when it, when it's it's at zero cost endorsement endorsement right was because you know Hopra or or Taylor Swift they will make money uh, you know with their image or their product no matter who's the president so it's th those kind of endorsement don't really give you give you a lot of um, a lot of don't really buy you a lot of votes uh, so that's that was also one big issue that I've seen with Kamala Harris campaigning, but the other issues, like other mistakes they made. I mean, for me, one of the biggest one they made, I was talking, and again, I'm willing to talk about these things because what I do, I like look at numbers and look at the data. I'm not making any sort of ideological judgment or preferences here. So for me, it's really easy. And I don't understand why people can engage in this conversation, honestly. But one of the biggest mistakes they made because they, they wanted to have a certain specific you know, voter going to the polls and, and, and cast their vote, which is, you know, white women in their 40s or in the 30s or in the 20s because they wanted to have that because they, they thought this would give us that kick to, to, to push through Trump's um, support. And in order to do so, what they did was in many states, they put on ballot like uh, the women reproductive rights. And what that happened, you know, that the effect that it had, if you look at the numbers, split the vote. So people say, OK, I don't have to vote for Kamala Harris to get this. I'll do it. But I still vote for Trump. So you see, like it's it's amazing in in states like um, some of the swing states, but even in Florida, Florida the the prop didn't pass because Florida has a threshold of sixty percent. But Florida, which is a deep red state now that massively voted for Trump, the percentage of people that wanted to have women reproductive rights enshrined in their legal system, constitution, and I don't know the specific of that prop over there, is fifty seven percent. Yeah. Well, this is something that I, that I think is is worth highlighting. I was actually going to do a future episode just all on abortion uh, because I'm thinking about this a lot. A lot of the way in which I see this uh, election results being litigated by progressives is I can't believe 50 whatever percent of the country voted against women reproductive rights. For me, Trump got elected despite abortion, Fight. meaning he was so palatable to people. And the Democrats were so off-putting that even though most of the country does not agree with the right-wing stance on abortion, they voted him in. So it's not that, you know, because a lot of Trump voters that I knew, you know, and again, you know, maybe it's not representative. I was talking to mostly, you know, Jews. So, you know, they, again, it's not the normal demographic, but I would imagine exactly as you said with Florida, there were about 20% of people who voted for Trump that were saying, you know, maybe the thing giving them pause was abortion. Um, and, and so, you know, that is that is not a position that's popular in any stretch no. of the imagination in the American election. No, but yet yet there's a there's a vast majority, there's a lot of people who voted for Trump that voted yes to that prop. And 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 I think putting that in the ballot gave these people the opportunity of saying, okay, I can vote, I can align with you on social issues. But I still want to align with the Republican Party when when it comes to to financial issues or immigration or foreign policy, and 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 so I think he, he did a better. Even though his campaign was all over the place, it was awful to see. Like from a technical standpoint, I think he did encounter that protest or that that you know that 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 sentiment of being uncomfortable with a lot of uh, democratic positions. Uh, and, and I think reducing that, like I see doing a lot of people reducing that to racism or or misogyny or these things, which might have had an impact, too. I'm not I'm not denying that is not willing is not being willing to understand the problem. And you can't fix the problem if you don't understand if you're not willing to admit that there's a problem there. You can't you can't really fix it. So I, you know, yeah, people think, people think, reject uh, that identity. People reject that identity politics. You know, deal with it. You can't come up and say, "Okay, well, we're going to double down on identity politics because we have to convince people to that." They're, people just told you, "We don't want to hear about that." That's not a problem, okay? And you know, I had this conversation with my students, and I think I don't want to, I don't, want, you know, uh, I don't point anybody out, but I think, I think in terms of like the priority scale or line, when we're talking about issues that are already being resolved, like same-sex marriage, and people think like, why sex, sex, same-sex marriage was so important for people, and people say like being recognized, the identity, no, when like if you look at the numbers, is insurance coverage, inheritance, so these are practical problems and that that the, the democratic party wasn't able to offer sustainable answer to yeah and i mean let's, let's have to realize it. a lot about uh you know how transgenderism 
was was a focal point. And actually, right, I don't know if you saw this, this news broke, I think, uh, yesterday, um, where there was a Texas Democrat um, congressman who was quoted in a New York Times article saying that transgender ideology is one of the reasons why Democrats lost. And this is a very interesting, and, and what he was saying is not anti-trans. What he was saying was, right. we need to get back to the important issues, like making sure that we protect healthcare for transgender individuals. That doesn't mean we need to side with the transgender activists for all of their policies, right? So you can have, right. you can have both. You can say, as a liberal, I want every single person in America to be treated equally, regardless of anything about them. If someone is Absolutely. trans, they should, of course, get whatever health care they need. If they are going through cell operation that is medically necessary, of course, insurance should cover that, you know, all the things. And also, this idea that there's no correlation between biological sex and gender, this idea that, you know, anybody can identify as anyone else and, you know, now you're going to have women sports ruined. You can also be against those things and you can you can do both. And actually, most of the trans people that I know, and again, this is anecdotal, you know, this is only five or six people agree with both those claims. But yet somehow it's become this, you know, either you fully accept everything and don't ask any questions or you're anti-trans. And and it's, it's the same thing for so many other things. Like like you said, the Democrats are not able to talk about any of the problems, right? It's the same thing with identity politics or DEI or all these things. You can't say these institutions are perfect because everybody over the last couple of years have seen the glaring flaws in it. And Trump was basically coming with a bulldozer and saying, well, I'm going to tear down all these institutions, gut the Department of Education, gut the FDA. And so if you're sitting there and you're like, well, the Department of Education does some good things and some bad things, but you have one party that says it's perfect and another party who says we're going to destroy it. Maybe let's flip a coin and go with the destroy. And I, I, I think yeah, that's that's more. that's also that's also what happened. I think, in my opinion, there was a lot of coin flipping or a lot of let's try this new thing and see how it goes, because the 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 two and and I wouldn't necessarily agree in terms of what Trump put it as as a as a as a opposite, but as as much as rigid view, because I think one of the things that, for example, um, kind of stroke my. Um, my attention again was, uh, you know, one was the abortion, for example. So the abortion was like, you know, I'm against abortion, but I don't favor a national ban, which gave people room to negotiate with the issue and negotiate with the vote. Where on the other side was, no, this is going to happen, and you're going to do this, you're on board or not. And by the way, I'm on board. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not denying. I, I actually, I actually, I'm a, I'm a pro-choice by. Um, by all means, but uh, that gave some people the uncomfortable feeling, as you were saying, that you have to buy into everything or you're out, and and that's that's a big issue. And and you know what you're saying before, I can support healthcare for for trans people, absolutely, one hundred percent, and and most people will do that. But most people will also say, but you know, this is where I put my, you know, this is where I don't, what I don't buy it. Okay. Yeah, it's a <laughs> You gotta buy everything, and you don't buy nothing. You're a bigot, and I call that a, a form of puritanism. Okay, that's a, that's a puritan uh, approach to um, to politics for me. Uh, that pushes people into into doing quite the opposite of that. It doesn't it doesn't bring people close to you. It just push people away because you're you're you you keep raising this bar of the perfect behavior and people are not perfect they don't want to be perfect and they don't want to be called out because they're not perfect and what you do is just calling people out because they're not perfect people will just say okay i'm done discussing with you and and, and it's really hard for you to keep these people together because one of the things that hurt harris was that in some areas she campaigned with uh, you know for the middle east and we can transit into that if you want right now she campaigned with this idea of okay israel has a right to defend itself you know this is this is we support our allies because the constituency there was more you know closer to that and then on other areas in other areas she campaigned with a more pro palestinians um campaign these two messages you know weren't, weren't getting along and 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 it was impossible for people to keep them together because of their their purity standards now are set is so high, you know that there's a lot of people saying, well, they're, they're, we're calling Kamala Harris genocidal Kamala Harris, because she dared to say that Israel has a right to exist, 
Uh, and and it's it's absurd. Yeah, I, of course, Trump was doing the same thing. And so this, I guess, gets us into a uh, conversation about you know, what you know. Right. No, no, no. Sorry, I'm sure to, uh, back I go for a second. You know, Trump Trump was, uh, you know, of course, you know, he's the great. Doing exactly the same thing, but he works. Uh, yeah, sorry. Whatever. And at the same time, you know, his last couple of months of the campaign, talking to especially, you know, the community in Michigan of, of you know, the, the Arab communities of Michigan, basically saying, you know, I'm going to end the war and I'm going to end, you know, the suffering in Gaza and in Lebanon. So it's sort of anyone's guess what a Trump policy in the Middle East will actually be. The sort of big question hinges on, is this a continuation of his 2016 presidency or are we about to see something totally new? I'm curious, you know, just to, to start with that question. I, I don't I don't think so for a lot of reasons. And the main reason why I don't think so is because uh, the well, because the presence of Elon Musk for sick for, for one. OK, so Elon Musk haven't done nothing new. I mean, he's doing exactly the same thing he was doing when he was close to the Democratic Party. Now he's doing with Trump because he's the highest bidder. So it's pretty much is the one that uh, that give him more space and will give more reassurance that things that he wants will be get, you know, got that get done. It's like, you know, transition into electric cars and maybe public transportation without either hyper loops or whatever that is. So all these things, space, um, support for space um, uh, exploration and uh, on programs, so all these things that were not present in 2016 were actually against in 2016. Now we're going to be brought back into that, and those are very similar to the thing that the Democratic Party wanted to do. So we'll see more of that, in my opinion. The other thing is also the constituency. I was mentioning before. Now Trump has a very big Arab constituency uh, within and within his is you know in his quiver. So well, they will have to consider that. Uh, I, I don't think it will be exactly what what was in 2016. There will be some similarities on immigration, maybe. Uh, that will be for sure something that uh, also immigrant communities favor, uh, which by surprise someone, but yeah, immigrant communities favor more stricter, a stricter immigration policy. Um, uh, on social issues, it will be different, in my opinion. Going back to the Middle East, it seems like, you know, even though, point granted, you know, Trump now has a lot more Arab Americans that are sort of in his base now than obviously eight years ago, it still seems like a lot of Israel's main adversaries are really upset that Trump got elected. I mean, Iran had, you know, was putting in a lot of disinformation against Trump. They even tried to assassinate Trump. I mean, this is, you yes. know, it, it didn't go super mainstream, but the New York Times did post on it and CNN posted, you know, if you just Google Iran assassination Trump, you know, just for listeners that are surprised about this, Iran has tried to assassinate Trump maybe more than once, but at least we know for sure once. So it seems like Iran at least is upset. And of course, Iran kind of controls the resistance against Israel and is what's stopping Israel from normalization with the rest of the uh, Arab countries in the Middle East. How do you see things playing out with Iran, with Hamas, with Hezbollah? I mean, obviously, you know, it's probably a little bit too soon exactly to know he hasn't even mm -hmm. appointed many of the uh, main yeah. people in his government yet. But if you had to guess, I mean, you know, if, if somebody was voting on the single issue of being pro-Israel, do you think that it was, uh, you know, was their vote for Trump reasonable? Was it not reasonable because Trump is allied with these America first, first people? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm curious just to isolate that very much. So I I don't I don't exactly know what is the number of Jews that voted for Trump because of his position in Israel. Uh, I think it was higher than the past elections probably, but I think the biggest chunk of the Jewish population here in the United States, which tend to identify with reforms, uh, or a liberal Jew, they voted still voted for Kamala Harris. So and and you know I think Trump expanded her his based on the, from like orthodox uh, orthodox Jews which traditionally tend to vote more on the right uh, to include some of the less you know extreme liberal Jews in in the United States but again I don't know that number that will be interesting uh, interesting to see because I think will also help to answer this question um, well it's too soon to tell a uh, couple of pointers of course he he now, he has a grudge, and I know it's a political grudge, but also a personal grudge against Iran at this point. Uh, so that will have a big impact on his policies vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis the Middle East. Um, not that it's not going to be something that will be well um, received in the Middle East itself, because as we know, 
and of course, uh, you know, it's all it's uh, Saudi's interest aligns with the uh, um, with the with with a more uh, with a rigid position towards Iran, and then I think will be a key for me in in understanding uh, Trump's uh, policies for uh, for the whole area in the next few days or maybe in the next few weeks or the few few weeks in the in his um, in his administration. I think personally that that would be a direction he would move. He would probably try to normalize the diplomatic relation between Israel, Saudi, Jordan, and other countries in the area. And that will probably take care of Iran itself. Um, we've seen, we've seen, for example, one thing that, that it might just be a coincidence, but we've seen with the reaction of the Qatari government to uh, to the election and the Qatari government immediately told Hamas leadership that it, they're not needed in the country anymore if they're not willing to negotiate they're actually thinking about stepping down as the negotiator between between Hamas and uh, and Israel which it's certainly not a position of someone who doesn't want to have anything to do with uh, with the um, with the uh, with Israel is a position of someone who say I, I'm stepping down here because I don't want to be seen by the Americans as someone who has a chip in the game and support Hamas or Hezbollah or uh, or other of these groups or proxies of Iran in the area. So I think I think that uh, that uh, they're abandoning ship uh, or at least they're taking time to to assess what Trump is going to do. And and in my view, again, everything will pass through a tentative or for, for for lack of better of better options to restart the Abrams, the Abrams Accord. So it sounds like you're breaking a pretty optimistic tone for for Israel in terms of the anti-Iran pro-Abraham accord and that Trump isn't really going to change what he was doing in in his last administration despite all the you know people around him having Well, changed. I mean it depends on the way you see it. Of course it could be seen as a as a as a pro-Israel perspective, right? But it's not going to be a pro-Israel perspective as in we're just supporting Israel against the whole world. We want results from Israel. We want we want Israel to normalize uh, their relationship with uh, with the other countries in the area that we consider potential partners, just to also to isolate the ones that we don't consider partners. So there will be there will be some demands uh, to uh, to Jerusalem uh, for for that to happen and certainly one of the things that Trump would want to fix immediately as soon as possible is the conflict. Uh, you can't have a normalization process if you're still bombing Gaza or or the Gaza Strip or if you're still making moves towards the towards uh, the West Bank. Um, there will be some hard negotiation to do there, of course, to establish some 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 borders and to to understand what is going to what is going to happen to those areas whether or not egypt will take more uh agency in in dealing with the gaza strip whether the jordanians or or the saudi will like to take a more active proactive roles with the uh, with the palestinian authority there will be some discussion and some hard discussion there uh with uh with uh, netanyahu or or who else in power in uh, in jerusalem so I'm not saying that Israel now, a lot of criticism will say like, oh, now Israel is going to get the way they want. I don't think this is happening because of the other thing, because of like even the base being more more open to, 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 to the Arab communities in the United States. But we're talking about Arab communities that in the majority of the cases are actually more willing to, uh, to normalize relationship than to decide with uh, uh, with extreme perspective in the area. I mean, in case of conflict, of course, uh, they have to show that their position aligns with the Palestinian completely, but I don't see them aligning completely with the Palestinians when the conflict is over. That's, sure. that's, so that's what I think. Uh, we've hopped around the globe over the last uh, hour. Is there anything else, any, you know, that you think people should be thinking about, looking out for? It can be, you know, anything we've discussed or something else. Uh, no, uh, I don't know if you if you have any other thing to say. I mean, we we spoke about a lot of things, <laughs> so we, we covered it all. Um, so thank you so much. I think this was uh, really interesting. We did sort of a uh, you know geographical tour of uh, politically fraught issues. So uh, I appreciate the conversation. Well, thank you so much, Daniel, for having me.
Thank you.